everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us for our third session of the Rose Mini Session, where we've been learning all about how to care for roses for um, success in the garden in South Dakota and beyond. Um, Maddie, just to tip you off, we've definitely had attendees joining us from Iowa and North Dakota and other states across the Midwest. So welcome to our out-of-state guests. We're certainly glad that you are here. Um, on day one, we heard from Chris Schlenker and Sydney Trio from McCrory Gardens. Yesterday, we got to look at some really cool insect photos and have a discussion with Dr. Amanda Bachman. And today I'm really excited that we have Dr. Madeline Shires with us to talk about all things related to rose diseases. And I will share that yesterday, Maddie and I got to spend some time together with some SDSU undergraduates, and we got to have a little practice session for roses um, because there was an undergraduate in the classroom who had lots of questions about them. So um, I'm excited that, that gardeners of all ages are excited about roses. Um, for anyone who doesn't know who I am by now, my name is Christine Lang. I'm an assistant professor and SDSU consumer horticulture specialist with Extension, and I have the privilege of working across the state of South Dakota. Um, much like our last two sessions, we're going to begin today with a presentation from our invited expert. And I will ask that attendees, if you can put all of your burning questions for Maddie into the Q&A, that would be awesome. And once Maddie is done sharing her content, we'll open it up for Q&A and um, have a conversation with our audience, so to speak. Um, as always, I am going to ask you to complete an evaluation at the end of this event, and we really appreciate your feedback. Um, it helps us improve our programming for future years, and it also helps me um, share with my colleagues all the cool things that I've gotten to do and who's or what people think of my events. Also, don't be afraid to jot down which of these issues you have maybe seen in your own gardens, which, which aha moments you're having, because we are going to have a short poll at the end of today's to discussion. So again, as questions arise, feel free to drop those in the Q&A. And without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Madeline Shires to present on all things related to rose diseases and how to manage them. Thanks, Christine. I'm sharing my screen and hopefully you can see that right now. Um, Looks great. And we're going to start the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about rose diseases and some management. I'm also going to talk about some not disease issues um, that do pop up in roses. Um, just a brief background, I did my PhD on rose diseases, especially rose rosette virus. So I've been in the rose world for quite a while now. Um, I do, um, you know, enjoy getting to talk about them and talk about their problems. So I also serve as the director of our SDSU plant diagnostic clinic, which I'll be talking about at the end of this. Um, but we are a service lab that you can send samples to whenever you have these diseases pop up and you're not sure what's happening. All right, here we go. So um, you're going to see a lot of pictures of my favorite roses in this PowerPoint because I had tons and tons of trials and hundreds of varieties of roses that we were screening. And so I have some of my favorite. So we're, these are, this is just kind of an overview of what we're going to look at. Um, I do have a few other diseases kind of mixed in here just to kind of briefly mention. So starting out, black spot. Um, this is one of the most common rose diseases in the U.S. It is a fungal disease caused by the fungus Diplocarpon rosier. Um, it is caused, so the symptoms are caused by the fungus growing and reproducing on the leaf of the plant and it can actually, re it can move to the stem. The risk of this is that the fungus can quickly get out of control, which leads to reduced vigor and plant defoliation at any point in the season. And if black spot is a continual issue for several years, black spot can eventually cause such reduced vigor that the plant dies. So here's an example of black spot um, on a rose variety, and you can hopefully kind of see those spots that don't have a super defined border. It's more of a feathery border. 
Um, and that's kind of Black Spot's hallmark is it doesn't, it has really feathery wavy borders. And here's another example. Now this rose actually has a couple of leaf spot diseases going on, but it does have pretty severe black spot happening. So this disease is mostly driven by leaf wetness. Um, the conidia, so the reproductive spores of that fungus are dispersed by splashing irrigation water, rain, as well as people and insects to a minor extent. This fungus does overwinter on fallen leaves and stems. It's less likely to overwinter here in South Dakota because we do get kind of chilly, but if it was a severe outbreak, it could overwinter. And I'm just gonna talk kind of briefly about how black spot infection happens. So that conidia or those reproductive spores land on the leaf and are get covered by a water droplet to have six to seven hours of leaf wetness um, usually more is better. And th that leaf wetness causes those spores to germinate and then they infect into the leaf and start causing those black spot symptoms. Um, irrigation is again, the bigger driver, irrigation and free water are kind of the biggest drivers of this disease. And this is just kind of a generalized um, recommendation for trying to mitigate leaf spot, especially black spot issues. Um, you can irrigate whenever there is already some free water on the foliage. So basically if it's if there's already um, the a little bit of water, just go ahead and irrigate and get that done so that the plant has time to dry out. So we actually recommend, and you'll hear me say a few times, don't water your leaves. I know that's not always possible, but if you can prevent watering your leaves and use a soaker hose or drip irrigation, that is the best way to water all plants, but especially roses as they do have several of these leaf spot diseases. Um, heavy dews or gatation um, can cause you know, that free water that's needed for spore spore germination. Um, and so it's just, again, kind of knowing how, how wet your leaves are and trying to make sure that they have time to dry out and they don't stand for several hours with leaf wetness um, is a great way to kind of mitigate these leaf spot diseases. Um, again, kind of going back to black spot, um, it is genetically variable. So we have a lot of different types of black spot and, um, some roses may be resistant to one type of black spot, but not the other, um, the environment. So extreme heat or extreme wetness could also affect any resistance that are in roses. And the picture on the left is from a trial in Mississippi and um, you can see that one plant had some resistance to black spot and the other did not and was completely defoliated and had reduced blooms because of black spot disease. So if you've got black spot and you know that it's a problem, there are some control measures. As I mentioned, there are some roses that are resistant. Um, so as you are picking new roses to put into your plantings, you know, if this is a continual issue for you, pick roses that show some tolerance or resistance to black spot. However, th there are a lot of cultural options for roses that are already in your plantings in your yard. Um, keeping those leaves dry as possible, especially in the evening into the overnight hours, promoting really good air movement. Um, sanitation, so picking up those leaves that have fallen off the plant because the fungus is actually going to overwinter and cause more infection from those fallen leaves. And then there is an option of a fungicide spray for very susceptible cultivars. However, timing is really important and it can be kind of costly. So we always recommend that you try some of these cultural practices to reduce disease before resulting to a fungicide. So I have a couple of other leaf spot diseases. Um, anthracnose leaf spot, it's, it's more of a rare disease, but we do see a lot of anthracnose on other crops here. So it is one that I wanted to mention and kind of say, hey, if you're seeing leaf spots, here's an example of another. 
Um, and thracnose management is very similar to black spot, you know, reduce leaf wetness um, and try to make sure there's good air movement to prevent um, the fungus from being able to get that perfect environment to germinate. Cercospora leaf spot, again, very similar to the others. Cercospora, we don't see super often, but we do have good conditions year to year um, or every other couple of years for it to kind of pop up. And so we'll see it in other crops. So it definitely can show up on roses. And for management of Cercospora leaf spot, again, definitely um, management of the water, the leaf wetness, not watering the foliage and um, making sure there's good air movement. This here is um, a, a figure that was put together. And I should mention, I forgot to, many of these slides I received from Mark Wendelm. If any of you have are involved with like the American Rose Society or something, you may have seen or heard Mark talk before. And so he provided me with a bunch of material, which has made putting together these talks really nice. So this is a comparison of those leaf spot diseases I was talking about, as, long, as well as downy mildew, which we don't see a lot here in South Dakota. But um, this is kind of a good diagram to kind of look at how these different leaf spot diseases develop. So you can see that for black spot, hot and wet weather, and thracnose, cool and humid weather, cercospora, warm and humid weather, um, and it kind of tells you different areas of the plants and what the spots look like. Again, with that black spot, you're going to see very feathery, diffuse borders, um, whereas in thracnose and cercospora have more defined borders. So that's kind of a way to figure out maybe which one you're dealing with. Another fungal disease that does pop up on roses is botrytis blight. Um, so if you've ever had your rose blooming these big, beautiful blooms, and then you go out in a couple of days and see this rotting occurring, um, that is almost definitely botrytis. Botrytis can just pop up on its own, but it does commonly come after some sort of damage. Um, you know, maybe it got a little too cold or something like that, and then the fungus kind of got a... Um, foot in. Another name for botrytis blight is gray mold. So um, just to kind of put those together, if you've heard of it called gray mold before. All right, moving into another fungal disease that I am sure a lot of people have seen here is powdery mildew. If you haven't heard of powdery mildew before, it is a fungal pathogen that grows white mycelia on leaf surfaces. It can occur at any point in time in the year, but especially during warm weather, under, which is kind of under that 90 degrees with moderate to high humidity. So we do commonly see powdery mildew toward the end of the growing season because that's when we kind of start hitting those temperature requirements. Virtually every type of plant is affected by powdery mildew. Um, and that is in every part of the plant world from crops to horticultural plants. So powdery mildew, um, I am not going to try to pronounce its scientific name because I will just embarrass myself, but you can see it there. Um, the signs of it, so the actual fungal, fungus is that white powdery fungal growth that you can, you'll see on leaves and you can see that here in the picture. Um, the symptoms of it are a blister-like area on the upper leaf surface um, and the spores, again, so that reproductive part of the fungus, they germinate, again, when, with high humidity. And we'll have some more. Powdery mildew um, moves into onto plants through the wind because those little spores are carried onto young leaves. The fungus can and does overwinter on stems and leaf buds. Um, it uh, can overwinter on leaves in warmer climates, but where we have a winter here. Um, the pathogen does, it can overwinter um, on dropped foliage. So again, sanitation is a really important management strategy for powdery mildew. So removing any diseased parts of the uh, plant will help reduce your inoculum load of powdery mildew. And you can see that picture on the left, you can see that white powdery growth that's starting to occur on those leaves. All right, so to control powdery mildew, prune out infected materials, 
rake up and remove drop foliage as again, that could have some of those overwintering spores and fruiting bodies on it um, and promote really good air movement. So don't have a bunch of rose bushes push planted together. Um, you can also prune the center of your rose to try to get some more aeration into that plant. There is some resistance available depending on the variety of rows that you purchase. Um, if, if it has been a big problem, there is some oils that can go out and some fungicides, but those are more preventative than treat than um, treating the disease. So they have to go out before the disease occurs, which is kind of hard to determine. Um, and again, remember that with fungicides, it can get pretty costly pretty quickly. So kind of using those cultural methods and resistance is the better way to manage this disease. And here's some more examples of powdery mildew. Um, I will say the plant on the left has a bunch of other disease issues, but you can see how quickly powdery mildew can get out of control if it's not um, managed. Okay, all right. Moving into another one, um, this is crown gall, and crown gall is a bacterial disease, and you can see it on many, many other crops. Um, if you've ever worked in a science field, you may have heard of crown gall or the bacteria that causes the gall being used in science research. Um, so it's it's a pretty versatile versatile bacteria. The nice thing is with crown galls, you can prune them off and you're unlikely to see recurrence of them. Um, if it does recur, then there are some management strategies, strategies that can be taken. We actually would receive crown gall on plants when we were buying them from um, some different growers. So it was just something that just happened to be on the plant and the plant was stressed at transplant and the, it produced a gall. Um, however, whenever we pruned them off, we would never see the galls again. Another one, and I don't know if Amanda mentioned these yesterday, but these are mealybugs. And the reason I mentioned mealybugs, you'll see in a second, but if you are putting your roses into a greenhouse or maybe even a sunroom for the winter, um, you could see mealybugs pop up. They really, really enjoy the greenhouse environments. And so mealybugs are the white little powdery looking um, uh, scale that you can kind of see on this plant. And they are feeding on the rows. And so it's kind of weakening the vigor. And the um, they're, if you catch them early, you could potentially manage them. However, they're very tiny and it's hard to see them at early stages. So it's more of a monitor your plant. And if you start seeing them, make some management decisions then. However, the reason I bring up mealybugs is that they cause sooty mold. And sooty mold is a, it's a disorder um, it's where a fungus grows on the honeydew produced by those um, mealybugs. So the mealybugs spit out honeydew, which is like a sweet frass that they're producing. And the fungus will grow on that honeydew and make the this black covering that you can see on the leaf and on the stem, which reduces the photosynthetic abilities of the plant and can lead to defoliation and plant loss. And in this picture, you can actually see the mealybugs on the stem behind the leaf. Um, we had a very severe outbreak of mealybugs and sooty mold in our greenhouse of one year. And so I got some really cool pictures, um, but we did lose a few roses. Another one that you could see in, uh, especially in a greenhouse, but they can also pop up in an open air environment is spider mites. If you haven't ever seen a spider mite before, um, it is definitely one to kind of look up and know and understand. They are commonly going to web your flowers in and you'll start seeing these little webs popping up all around your blooms. Um, there are several management, um, chemical management options available. Um, you can also prune off the affected parts of the plant. Um, that won't completely stop them, but it will slow them down. So just a few insects and other diseases that you 
should keep in mind. All right, moving into um, so a couple of rose viruses. So rose mosaic virus complex, you may not have heard the complex side of this before. Um, so what that basically means is that this is a viral disease that's caused by one or a combination of two to three viruses. They all cause similar symptoms. And um, unless you submit samples to the diagnostic clinic, you're not gonna know exactly which virus is causing the problem. It is possible with uh, diagnostic testing to figure that out. However, it does not generally matter unless you're just really interesting. What is going to cause the symptoms of this? It's going to be cool temperatures, kind of that 60 to 75 range, and either propagation through cuttings or grafting or insect feeding. Commonly, your plants, you're going to purchase them, and they're probably, they may already have the virus in there. That's because it doesn't um, always express for, it may be in the plant for several years before it ever shows symptoms. So um, you could actually bring a plant in with this virus and not know it. The viruses are going to be symptomatic. So you're going to be able to see that that disease is there in the cooler weather. However, symptoms and virus levels decrease as our temperature rises. Um, all varieties of roses are susceptible to these viruses. So here's some really fun examples of rose mosaic virus complex. Um, there was a rose garden at one of the places I worked at, and there was a severe outbreak of rose mosaic virus. And you can just see the modeling and um, the chlorosis that's occurring on these leaves. Here's some more examples. This one actually had, um, we tested it to figure out what viruses were in it and it had two different viruses. And here's some that are a little harder to check, a little less pronounced. Um, you can kind of see what we call an oak leaf pattern here. So the leaf looks more like an oak leaf. Um, that is one thing that can be caused by these viruses. Um, these viruses can be kind of difficult to find as they the symptoms typically show up on the lower part of the plant. So if you are concerned you might be dealing with some viruses, it's important to start monitoring early in the season and especially monitoring the lower part of the plant. There are a few ways to manage it. Make sure you're buying plants or cuttings, depending on how you're sourcing your roses from a reputable source. Again, like I mentioned, you may there you could accidentally bring this in on a plant that you buy, especially if it has not been tested and verified as a clean plant. There are no no roses are completely tolerant or resistant. Removal of heavily symptomatic plants is a good idea. It's harder for these viruses to move because their insect vectors are pretty rare, but they can move. Um, they, the viruses are typically not super damaging to the plant, but they can detract from plant attractiveness as they can reduce your bloom sizes and your bloom amount. Um, so that's, unfortunately, removal of plants is really the best way to prevent this, but it's not going to completely kill a plant. So the next one I'm going to talk about is rose rosette virus. And this is actually the disease that I did my PhD work on. And a little bit of history on this virus is it was first reported in Manitoba, Canada. Um, it moved all throughout the upper plain, other upper Great Plains and then um, down into the south and to the east. We don't see it very frequently here in South Dakota. Um, but we have no reason to think that it wouldn't be here. So it is commonly called rose rosette disease. Again, so that's the disease caused by the virus. The virus is spread through areified mite feeding as well as grafting and cuttings. Um, seed and root grafting are very minor routes of spread. The All roses are affected. Um, we found it on wild-grown roses, landscape roses, cut flowers, 
Um, there's not there. We do suspect that there is some tolerance or resistance within the rose population, and there's a lot of ongoing work looking to find it. Um, however, we don't know too much right now on what varieties specifically are resistant. So this is a extreme example of rose rosette. You can see that that rose is just just not happy. Um, I have some close up pictures, but this is what we see a lot of times in the lower Midwest and the South. Um, it causes all sorts of problems, which is broom, small leaves, abnormal redness. Um, so we do try to keep an eye on it and we do have a nationwide monitoring project. So that's another reason I'm bringing up this disease is that if you think you've seen it, um, please reach out because it kind of helps us track how this disease is spreading. So here's some more examples. You can see what we call a witch's broom on this plant. So there's an abnormal amount, a large amount of stems coming out of one node. You can also see the abnormal reddening on of leaves. And here's another one. So this is a witch's broom and you can kind of see how big and bulky that growth is and it's kind of laying off the side of the plant. And here's another one that's a little bit harder to see um, just and monitoring on the plant, but it is a little witch's broom that has grown off of the plant. This is one of my favorite pictures that I've uh, found. This was a multiflora rose, so a wild growing rose and it had pink canes, hyperthorniness, pink veins, um, all sorts of interesting disease symptoms. And so this is one of one way to determine if it's rose rosette. So here's another example of rose rosette. We were doing some grafting experiments and so we were able to transmit the disease through grafting and this is the results of that. You can see the abnormally red leaves the hyperthorniness, the abnormally um, colored and shaped thorns. This is some more of those plants. And then this is another one. Um, you wouldn't necessarily suspect that this plant has a problem. However, if you look in the background, you can see that nice, pretty, normal looking uh, new growth versus these bright pink leaves that are misshapen. Um, and I have a better comparison picture here in a minute. Here's another plant with a witch's broom on it. This plant had all sorts of diseases happening. Um, I just kind of wanted to show that it is possible to have um, multiple diseases occur on one plant. So it had rose rosette on the right and some sort of leaf spot disease happening on the left. So this is um, a good comparison slide. I just want to emphasize that it is normal for roses to have red new growth. And that's what I'm showing on the right side of the screen. Um, you know, that is normal, healthy new growth. The leaves look the appropriate size, the appropriate shape, the right color. Whereas you compare it to the plant on the left and that new growth is very, very red. There's tons and tons of thorns. Um, the leaves don't look the right shape. So, you know, it's, 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 you have to kind of know what your rose looks like to determine if you're seeing rose rosette disease issues. But um, there, you know, no, red growth on a rose is normal. If you suspect you've had rose rosette disease, please let me know before you rip out the plant. Um, but removal of the symptomatic plant is the absolute best way to manage this disease. The mite that spreads the plant is widespread across the United States um, and it can overwinter in South Dakota. So please, if you're seeing this, let me know and I can kind of help you work on some management strategies. Um, diverse planting, so having less than 50% of your total yard plants be in roses is a really great way to kind of slow the movement of that mite down. Um, also, observing neighboring roses, observing wild grown roses in your area to look for symptoms is another great way to kind of know if it's near you. So that is pretty much all of my disease talks. However, because I do work in the diagnostic clinic or run the diagnostic clinic now, um, 
we do get a, a number of plants that are suspected for a disease, but it actually ends up being abiotic, so nutritional, environmental, and roses, just like everything else, um, are not immune to nutritional issues. So this is an example of some of the more common nutritional issues in roses. So you can see nitrogen deficiency kind of ca causes the um, chlorosis that's starting from the outside of the leaf and moving in. Magnesium deficiency changes the color of those leaves from kind of that dark green to more of a pale green color. Salt toxicity is going to look like the leaves are being burned from the margins, uh, the leaf margins to the um, middle of the leaf. Iron deficiency is another really common one, and that's where the veins stay green, but the rest of the leaf turns a kind of a yellow color. Another one that we can see from time to time is fasciation. And fasciation is not a disease. It's actually an environmental or genetic issue. Um, we do get it sent in in the South a lot because it can mimic rose rosette, but fasciation is totally normal. You can prune off the cane that has the fasciation occurring and the plant is gonna be perfectly fine. Um, so fasciation is basically where the stems have gotten flat and kind of wide and the leaves may not look normal. The blooms may look abnormal. Um, so again, not a disease issue and not dangerous to your plant. Another one that I wanted to point out is that roses are very sensitive to herbicides. Um, if you are spraying your yard or spraying in your flower beds to help control weeds or grass, just know that you could have what looks like a disease pop up on your plant and it's actually actually due to herbicide damage. So this is an example of a glyphosate exposure on a rose. Um, you could see how that almost mimics rose rosette with the abnormal leaves and kind of the bunchy growth but it's actually glyphosate damage. There are several other herbicides out there that cause the same type of symptoms on plants. Um, so do keep in mind that if you're starting to see something and you say, oh, I think that's a disease, it's good to kind of mentally think back, like have I sprayed any herbicides around my plant recently? Um, because that could be what is actually causing your problem. Um, another one I just wanted to mention, I just thought of, is that there are mulches that have herbicide already on them. Those I would avoid putting around your roses because they actually cause quite a bit of herbicide damage to the roses. Um, so it's just kind of being conscious of where you're using herbicides. This is another one I did see on some roses this last summer. Um, it's kind of black leaf or bronzing. Um, that is caused by high temperatures. Um, we were kind of saw it in August after those really high temperatures in July in 2023. Um, yeah, so I kept my talk kind of short so that if we had questions, need to have further discussion, we could do that. So in summary, roses are susceptible to many diseases. Most of those are fungal diseases. Most of our disease problems can be prevented through good management strategies, such as not watering our foliage, reducing leaf wetness, making sure we have good aeration um, through our plants. Um, knowing what disease is affecting your plant is important. Um, and many of the problems that we see on roses are nutritional. And just kind of overall, good management practices are going to lead to healthier roses. Um, again, just to kind of plug for our South Dakota Plant Diagnostic Clinic, um, we are a service-based clinic that provides plant disease diagnostics. Um, we did move to a new space, so if you've ever used us before, we were over in the Plant Science Building, and now we are in Berg Ag Hall. Um, so we are excited to be in a new space and be able to offer some increased testing and different types of diagnostics. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me or feel free to look up South Dakota Plant Diagnostic Clinic on Google. Um, you can find all of our information there on our website as well as submission forms. 
And the other one is, is do you have rose problems? Are you seeing these leaf spot diseases? Are you seeing viral diseases? Are you seeing something else? Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, again, there's my email. And I have a goal of hopefully getting out some rose disease and disorder fact sheets and literature over the next couple of years. And I would love to know what diseases you're seeing in the state so that we can tailor it to um, what is currently happening in South Dakota. And again, several of these slides and pictures were provided from Dr. Mark Wendell. He is retired from the University of Tennessee. And then these are a couple of citations for some really informative disease and disorder literature. So I'll hold this up here for just a second in case anyone wants to take a picture of that and kind of go um, investigate that. The American Rose Magazine, if you don't subscribe to that, that's an amazing way to get tons and tons and tons of rose information. Um, yeah. That is all I have. So let me know your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and this is my favorite rose. This is a Basie's Purple Rose. It's a Rosa Rugosa, if any of you um, have worked with other Rugosa roses. That's beautiful and a really fun way to end, Maddie. So yeah, if you're okay with stop sharing your screen, and we'll yep. have a discussion. We do have some questions pouring in, but while it's fresh in people's minds, and so I don't completely forget, um, we would love to pull you on which of these photos or diseases or abiotic issues look familiar to you. So in the background, John Green with our ed tech department um, pulled up a poll and you should be able to click as many as you would like, um, I believe. If not, you might have to pick the one you've seen the most. <laughs> Um, but if you can take a minute and weigh in on what, um, what issues you've seen and look familiar to you, because this will help Maddie and I understand what's going on across the state and across the Midwest. Our friends from outside of South Dakota, you are welcome to vote as well. <laughs> and Maddie, maybe while we're waiting for some yep. questions to filter in, would you mind typing your email address in the chat so that everyone can grab that? Yes. All right. I'm uh, guessing that we have received our responses. So I'm going to, I'm going to trust that um, John can close the poll for us so we can see the results. Well, we've got lots of people who have seen leaf spots, Maddie. I see um, that. <laughs> lots of people who have seen black spot. That would have been the one I would have clicked. Lots of powdery mildew. Um, some people said none. We're we're kind of jealous of you, you 10%. Yeah. <laughs> now, I guess that could be because you haven't grown roses. But if you've grown roses and not seen any of these issues, we're very thrilled for you. And I'm slightly jealous. <laughs> and Maddie, it looks like about 20% of people have seen nutrient issues. So Okay. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. We really appreciate that. Now, um, Maddie, let's, I'm going to start with um, a question. Can you share the link from the nutritional deficiency slide? I wasn't able to write it down in time. <laughs> yeah, the nutritional deficiency slide. Let me go back to that real quick. So we'll give Maddie just a second. And um, while Maddie's looking for that, Shameless plug, if you'd take a moment to fill out our evaluation today, we'd certainly appreciate it. Um, I will share that um, Maddie and I realize questions come up after the lunch and learn, and there might be things that you are curious about related to horticulture. Um, we do have the SDSU Extension Horticulture Hotline, the Garden Hotline, and that is a great opportunity for anyone, any citizen of South Dakota to to give us a call or send an email or stop by our regional centers during the growing season and um, get your horticulture questions answered. So I will share the link to our garden hotline in the chat. And also if you enjoy programming like this, please, please, please um, subscribe to our garden and yard newsletter. I'll also share that link for all of you. Um, but if also if you just look up SDSU extension garden and yard newsletter, that's a bi-weekly newsletter that is full of articles written by myself, Maddie, and many of our wonderful colleagues. Plus, we share um, 
links and promotions for SDSU Extension events related to food, farming, and gardening. So um, it's a great way to get a hold of us. All right. Um, so again, if you think of questions after the fact, don't be afraid to reach out to Maddie if it's specific to Rose diseases. Um, if it's something else related to gardening, don't be afraid to contact the hotline. They'd be happy to help you. All right, Maddie, let's kick it off with some more questions. All right. So um, one person comments, I've heard of spraying with diluted milk or baking soda to control powdery mildew. Thoughts on this practice? I caution against that um, only because I've not seen it be super efficacious. Um, there, I was actually looking that up as you were talking. <laughs> um, so we've not seen that work that well, just, and it kind of, it, it's more of a preventative as many of these other Many of our practices are, you know, you have to put it out before you're seeing symptoms. Um, and it's basically just kind of covering the space and out competing the fungus. Um, however, you would have to put it out pretty frequently and you could, especially if you're using um, the, what was it, baking baking soda, um, you, there's a chance that you could cause another problem in your plant putting out a lot of baking soda. Um, but yeah, it, it's not going to treat powdery mildew. So if you're already seeing symptoms and you start trying to put those out, it's not going to stop the powdery mildew. Um, and that's kind of the thing with a lot of these um, alternative to chemical strategies is that they're not going to prevent, they're not going to treat a disease. They're only going to help prolong and prevent it from occurring. Awesome. Thank you, Maddie. Um, so we've had a few people that are really curious um, if you have a take on um, specific fungicides you'd recommend or specific active ingredients. Um, I don't know because most of my knowledge is from a different state. And so I'm not 100% sure what's labeled here in South Dakota. However, um, all of your fungicides are going to list out if they are approved for roses in that label. So I highly recommend that if you're standing in the store and trying to pick a fungicide that you just open that label book that's attached to that fungicide and start looking through it. It will tell you if it's labeled and safe for roses and that can help you guide your decisions. All right, so Maddie, some more questions related to fungicides. Mm -hmm. um, let me back up. Is there a systemic fungicide available to control black rot? To control which disease? Black rot. Or black mm -hmm. spot, I think. I, I okay. definitely just read that black <laughs> spot. <laughs> I believe that there is a systemic fungicide. I cannot think of the name of it right now. Um, I know that there are several fungicides out there to control um systemic fungicide. I'm looking right now. <laughs> but there are um, some fun several fungicides out there to help control um, black spot. And I believe there are some systemic ones that are options. Again, um, if you will, if you just kind of do a little bit of a Google search, you'll be able to find that. Or if you'll shoot me an email after this and remind me that you had that question, I'll actually kind of look through that and kind of help you, you know, select which ones might work for you. Okay. Excellent. So what we're hearing is we need to be pushing out some good recommendations on ingredients. Yes. To look <laughs> yes. All right. So now kind of transitioning to some application questions. Um, yes. Again, so just really reiterate, when is the best time to apply? I fungicide for black spot disease. So again, a lot of our fungicides are preventative. So it really needs to go out before you're seeing the symptoms. So if you know that black spot has been a problem on your roses in the past, 
and you know that it's getting close to the time of year that it usually pops up, or you are starting to see the very, very, very early signs of it, get a fungicide out just as soon as you can. Um, because most of the fungicides are not curative. So again, it's just kind of like everything else, they're preventative. So they've got to go out either before disease development or right at the very onset, or else you're not going to get a lot of control. However, the nice thing is with leaf spot diseases, as long as you're not having a severe outbreak and you're only seeing it on a leaf here and a leaf there, you can put out that fungicide and help protect the leaves that are not showing symptoms yet. So, um, you know, it's a lot of monitoring the plants, knowing what's happening in your garden and making those management decisions. But if you know that you've had problems, you know that the weather conditions are becoming conducive for disease, that's when I would start um, making those plans to put out a fungicide. Awesome, thank you, Maddie. So as we think about roses that are coming out of dormancy, um, you know, we've kind of been sitting in false spring and obviously <laughs> winter is going to make a bit of a comeback this weekend for many of us in South Dakota and other parts of the Midwest. Um, but if someone is leaving for 30 plus days right now, they're curious, should I be putting down any sort of a three-way fertilizer, herbicide, insecticide right now or do that when they return from vacation? I I don't know what the weather is going to look like for April, um, but right now our weather is not super conducive for fungicide or fun, fungal development. Um, I'm not super educated on, you know, the insect and weed side of things, but I can say that right now our weather, if we kind of keep in this very, very cool weather, very, very cold nights for a while, um, most of our fungal diseases are not going to start being a problem yet. Okay. And I would say um, the same thing for for insects, again, would totally defer to Dr. Amanda Bachman for that, but um, roses are going to, you know, just, I realize depending on how far north or south you are in the Midwest, your roses are maybe at a different state, but I would say it's pretty early for worrying about um, a lot of issues, but it's good to be thinking about it. And if you'll recall, um, Dr. Amanda Bachman yesterday did reference that um, using a three-in-one product, um, especially if you don't have a known insect issue, could actually have more um, damaging effects on you know, beneficial insects or things that we we want to have around. So do keep that in mind as well. Um, all right. So I think one last question related to fungicide right now, Maddie, is, is it okay to apply fungicides for black spot more than once per season? That is going to be um, dependent upon the certain active ingredient that you're using. Most of our fungicides are going to have a limit of one or two, maybe maybe three applications per season. Um, it will tell you in that label of the fungicide that you're using um, what the use, what the labeled use is. It's also going to tell you how to reduce fungicide resistance. Because just like we get fungicide resistance in our row crops, it can pop up in our horticultural crops too. Um, so definitely make sure that if you're using um, any sort of fungicide that you read that label and understand what the restrictions are, what your max application is, and understand how to be rotating your active ingredients so that you don't end up with black spot resistance or something crazy happening on your plants. Excellent, thank you. So um, kind of transitioning away from fungicides, but thinking about fertilizers and wondering if you have a take or recommendations from your experiences with your rose plots on, um, you know, best fertilizer. And we have some astute attendees today. They very specifically asked best fertilizer um, analysis. So, you know, should we be looking for a higher portion of N or a lower portion of N? Maddie, do you have any insights? And I can certainly follow up with um, yeah. some of mine as well. <laughs> um, on a fungicide or on a nutritional, you know, kind of recommendation, um, if you have doing a soil test is going to be a great way to figure out, you know, what nutrition that you're needing. 
Um, it's going kind of talking on fertilizers specifically. I love Osmocote fertilizer because it's a long term, long release fertilizer and our roses very much enjoy it. Um, but if you're needing um, a boost of fertilizer, um, there are some others out there. There's a product, I believe it's just called Rose Food or Rose and Flower Food. I can't remember. Um, but it also um, is really good to kind of help boost your uh, plant health and help boost your number of blooms. And so that's that's kind of the extent of my knowledge, but I do know Osmocote works really, really, really well for roses, especially if you're growing them in containers um, or if you're overwintering them in containers in a greenhouse or a sunroom or something like that. And I will just follow up. Um, and, and I believe that we might have touched on this discussion on day one, but it's a nice refresher for folks and nice to bring it back. Um, but when you look at a fertilizer label, there's going to be three numbers separated by dashes, and that tells you the percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in your fertilizer. Um, with roses, um, especially if you want to start with what we consider a balanced fertilizer, so those numbers might be 10-10-10 or 20-20-20 um, early in the season, that's going to help um, as those roses are putting out all of that new growth as they're coming out of dormancy. Um, later in the season, we don't want those roses pushing out so much beautiful lush green growth that they're not also putting carbohydrates and stored elements back into their root system so that they overwinter. So we can cause our plants to put out too much green growth and then they actually might not overwinter as well and they can actually be damaged. So, um, Typically with roses, we want to do our last fertilizer application um, by mid to late July. Also, roses might be a little more heat stressed in late July into August. So that's another reason not to over fertilize them and force them to do all of this growth if we don't have the water and temperatures to support that. So if you're going to do, um, you know, your first application, something like with three numbers that are all the same or very similar, um, you know, those late season applications, that first number nitrogen would not be quite as important. And you could focus on, you know, are the last two numbers for phosph phosphorus and potassium larger, which would support um, ongoing bloom production, especially if you're someone who's deadheading and wants a lot of bloom. So excellent question. Um, I'm going to just follow up. We, we do have the question of does South Dakota State do soil testing? Um, great question, and I would urge you to look at um, the chat. I've provided a link. At this time, South Dakota State does not have um, public soil testing services, but our colleague Anthony Bly put together a nice article that talks about neighboring universities that do. Um, South Dakota, or not South Dakota State, North Dakota State, the University of Minnesota, and I believe Iowa State University all have public soil testing labs. Um, double check on Iowa State because I don't want to miss misspeak, um, but I can say confidently that NDSU and the U of M do have public labs. They do, you know, accept samples from the public for a, a low cost. And then there are a lot of commercial labs that, again, um, will accept soil samples. And when you submit samples, it's best to say, you know, where you collected that sample from. And they, um, all of those companies or the universities will have a, a simple sheet on this is how you collect the sample. And there will be a form you fill out that you indicate this came from a home garden or um, if you were doing, you know, nursery production of roses, because we have, you know, if anyone from a commercial setting is listening in, you know, you'd fill in that information because it might adjust the recommendation. Um, so Maddie, I heard you say something about overwintering and potted roses, and we had a question about that. Okay. Uh, I overwintered two rose bushes. When would it be safe to put those pots back outside? Well, I would recommend that you um, wait until our last hard freeze before you put them back outside um if you if we if and probably when we do start having some good temperatures you could start putting them outside for a few hours a day and kind of start getting them reacclimated to the outside um but i always recommend especially if you're going to planning to keep them in pots that you not put them back outside until after our last hard freeze because um, that can actually freeze the roots and cause a lot of damage to your plant pretty quickly 
Awesome. And it would undo all of your hard work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so a fun technical question, Maddie, what causes fasciation? Yeah, so fasciation, it's not heavily researched. Um, we do know that it's most often caused by an environmental issue or a genetic uh, issue. So we would see it a lot of times in the South whenever we had had a really um, odd spring. And by odd, I mean, um, you know, we like had a hell storm and the plants got some damage from the hill. And there was a plant that just decided it needed to have fasciated stems. Um, so that would be an environmental example. And then there are just some varieties that for some reason, they are more prone to producing fasciation. Um, so, and I know that's kind of like a vague answer, um, but again, it's not been heavily researched. So we just, we don't have, you know, sturdy data, but we do know that it's environmental or genetic always, and it's not associated with the disease. Awesome. Thank you. I'm learning, I'm learning new things today as well. <laughs> um, so Maddie, when you talked about, um, you know, watch out for mulches that might have herbicide in them. Can you mm -hmm. elaborate on that? How would we know that mulches have herbicide on them? Yeah, so the mulches will actually um, have usually somewhere on the bag that they have a herbicide product in them. Um, there are a couple of brands specifically that do provide um, mulches with herbicides. And you can definitely look those up. We had bought a, a few bags of it from um, Lowe's and didn't realize what we got. And we accidentally killed some plants. And that was how I learned. Um, <laughs> so I try to help people not do that frequently. Um, but yeah, if you have any further questions on that, I can definitely, you know, shoot me an email and I can definitely give you a little more information on that and talk to you about that a little more on uh, trying to learn how to identify if it has an herbicide or not, if you have further questions. So read the label, look for ingredients. Yes. That's what we want to do. Definitely. And if you're sourcing, you know, if you're using just, you know, wood chip mulch or straw mulch from a neighboring farm, we're typically um, not worried. Even if, um, you know, even if a crop or a mulch, if it had something, you um, like Roundup sprayed on it um, or a glyphosate, a glyphosate type product of Roundup because Roundup now means a few different active ingredients. So I want to be careful, um, but glyphosate usually breaks down pretty quickly on, on crop residue, but um, things like 2,4-D um, or some of those other um, broadleaf um, herbicides that might end up being sprayed um, and might be on crop residue, those tend to last a little longer and take more time in the sun with microbes acting on them to break down. And those, those can sometimes cause issues as well. So Maddie, as our time draws to an end, I've got two more questions and I think they're fun ones to end on. But I just okay. want to remind everyone, if you would um, be so kind to fill out the survey for today's event, um, we really appreciate hearing what you think. If you have any feedback about today or any of the sessions, I love I love hearing that, good, bad, otherwise, ideas for the future. Um, it just really helps us tailor our programming and make sure that um, people can learn more. I've been getting lots of questions about, is has this been recorded? Where can I watch it after the fact? If you look up the SDSU Extension YouTube channel, all three sessions will be posted online for you to rewatch or share with your friends or share among your master gardener club or use in your classroom. We would love to um, love to see this utilized. And again, um, there is a spot on that survey for you to request future topics and we definitely look at those. So Maddie, um, two questions kind of related to where do I buy and how do I ID roses? Okay. Um, so you mentioned recommend reputable sources. Um, what's your definition of a reputable source to buy roses? I'm guessing I maybe shouldn't mail order mine from Texas. <laughs> well, lucky for you, most of the rose growers are not in Texas. Um, so that is actually a really fun question. Um, most of your major rose companies actually grow in California and Arizona. So um, they don't get exposed to diseases that frequently. Um, so 
more on the, you know, reputable source is I don't recommend, you know, getting roses from, you know, someone that is just growing roses in their yard. Um, I know that it's kind of common for, you know, us to say, oh, that's a gorgeous rose. I would love to have a cutting of that. Um, doing that, and especially if it is one that um, has a disease, you're bringing that disease into your plantings. So, you know, I, I, I hate to discourage, you know, sharing plants and sharing cuttings amongst our home gardeners, but that is a way that a lot of our viruses are spread. Um, actually, in one of those articles, if you go look them up, um, you'll see where they had a perfect example of rose mosaic viruses. People, some a home grow, grower had said, oh, this rose is beautiful. It has these variegated leaves and had sent tons and tons of cuttings to lots of other people. And it actually be, it was that the rose had rose mosaic virus and he had sent rose mosaic virus across the country. Um, so, you know, I recommend that you buy from uh, companies that have a good um, record. Um, if you, there are issues in the South, not so much here of buying from like box stores because they sit out, the plants sit out and are exposed to diseases while they're sitting on the shelf. Um, but that's not as much of a problem here in South Dakota. Um, but if you are in the, you know, if you, even if you're in Iowa, Rose Rosette is a big problem in Iowa, um, in certain areas. So, you know, we always make sure, the biggest thing that we always recommend is that if you're buying from anywhere, check the plant over, look for those disease symptoms, look for anything that looks weird. If you see plants that have disease symptoms that are just kind of planted around the store that you're buying from, you can assume that, you know, if you're seeing black spot on a landscape rose and you're buying a rose from that store, that there's a good chance that that rose already has that disease. So, you know, just being aware of where you're getting your roses from, um, being aware of, you know, what's could be in that area of where that rose has been at. Um, and again, I hate to discourage sharing cuttings, but I do discourage it for the fact that it is one of the easiest ways to spread a lot of diseases. And I'll just add, um, and, and again, thank you. I realize some people are maybe jumping back from their lunch breaks, but feel free to hang on. We're going to answer one more question if you'd like. Um, but I will add on the flip side of that coin from a you know disease management standpoint, but as we think about reputable sources, it's also really important whether you're shopping at a box store, you're visiting your local um, independent garden center, either way, pay really good attention back to, you know, read the fine print, so to speak, but look at those rose labels and remember that hybrid teas, although they're beautiful, and some of our other hybrid rose types, although they're beautiful, um, might not be winter hardy for growing conditions in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa down there, you can get away with a little bit more, so we're jealous. Um, but pay attention to your hardiness zone. And I did drop a link to um, the uh, an article about USDA hardiness zones, a reminder that the map has been updated for 2023. It's not a magic wand. It does not mean um, if your zone changed from 4B to 5A, it, I would say cautious optimism with, with integrating some of the less cold tolerant roses into your garden. And remember that hardiness zones, again, are not a promise that this thing will grow. It's just another tool to help you make a decision. So um, pay attention to hardiness zones. And, you know, in, in winters such as this one, where we have less um, soil coverage, that, that can be a little bit harder on things like our roses or our herbaceous perennial plants that don't have that protection from a hard, hard, hard freeze into the soil. So um, one thing to think about, um, because I'm a softie for questions, Maddie, I'm going to add, I'm actually going to add two more and then we will really wrap it up and let poor John Green back to, get back to his day. <laughs> um, so is buying bare ro roses better than potted? Well, um, so I'm assuming if you say potted, you're referring to grafted roses. Oh. Um I don't know. That's I, I'm guessing they actually <laughs> might mean um like already like in a just in a pot. In, in a pot. Okay. Okay. Versus 
you know, versus in a bag. Like the actual bear. Yeah. Yeah. But we um, can also talk about the other thing as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, buying, they kind of both have their, you know, advantages and drawbacks. Um, a potted rose is um, probably going to have a little bit more transplant shock whenever you do put it into your landscape. Um, but you know, it's kind of already going, you kind of get a jump on the growing season because it's already leafed out. It may have already started blooming. Whereas a bare root is going to be dormant. Um, it's not going to suffer from transplant shock quite as much because it's not awake yet. Um, but it is going to take it, you know, longer to kind of get going and start leafing out and start blooming. Um, so, you know, long term, I don't know that there's any difference between them. Um, but short term, you're going to have, you know, a few drawbacks, whichever option you choose. All right. So Maddie, um, do you, do you want to tackle anything else related to grafted or own rut or? Yeah. So, and this was one of those questions that Christine was referencing at the start of this that we had from a student. Um, and we still don't have a super accurate answer for it. Um, so if you have, you know, things on it, um, please let us know. So the student had asked if it was more common for us to have grafted roses or bare root roses or own root roses, however you may call it. Um, but roses that have not been grafted, roses that are still on their own roots, asked which was more common in South Dakota. Um, and Christine and I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> um, so we, um, there, there are some, you know, drawbacks or advantages to each type. So the reason that roses are commonly grafted is that you are needing improved disease resistance, improved environmental resistance, um, or just improved vigor. And so we'll graft, you know, our, we'll do, we'll make a graft union and use a scion that has those desirable blooms, those desirable um, leaf traits, but we'll graft it onto one of those hardier root stocks that can kind of survive everything. Um, the downside to doing a grafted rose is if it dies back and it dies back below the graft union, you are not going to have that, you know, beautiful, gorgeous rose that you started with. Um, and I did see a comment somewhere where they had said they thought that their rose had died back below the graft union because now the rose was only blooming once a year and the colors had changed. Um, and that's probably very much what happened is that the rose did die back below the graft union. And so you've kind of, you've lost what you originally bought that rose. Um, and that's one thing when the roses are still on their own roots is that they are more, um, resistant or more able, I wouldn't say resistant, more able to come back if they have a dieback event. So as long as the roots don't die, the plant that comes back from those roots is going to be the plant that you originally purchased. So, um, you know, and it's becoming much more common to have roots that are on or have plants that are on their own roots simply for that advantage of if or when it has a dieback event from disease, from heat or whatever, the plant that comes back from the roots is the plant that you started with. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of what I've got on that. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Christine. <laughs> nope, I think that's perfect. And it's a great segue. Um, so someone put us on the spot and cornered us and I still don't know <laughs> if I have an answer and I've had minutes to think about it. Um, but do we have a favorite rose that's super resistant to diseases and beautiful. And I have a few thoughts to give you time to maybe pick one or two, Maddie. If yeah. You have <laughs> um, I just want to highlight once again, I know you all have probably heard me say this three days in a row, um, but I would really encourage you to check out the um, American Rose Trials for Sustainability website. Um, the acronym is ARTS, A-R-T-S. So if you just Google ARTS and roses, you'll definitely find the website. Um, but they have a great list of roses that have been trialed across the United States. And these are meant to be, um, you know, rough and tough, 
low input roses and they don't they don't win um, unless they are beautiful and disease resistant. I can say that as someone who's evaluated these trials for several years, I ask questions about, you know, are there disease symptoms? If so, you know, how much of the plant is covered? Um, does it overwinter? And I also get to comment on how beautiful are the blooms and do they smell nice? So I literally get to stop and smell the roses as does the rest of the evaluation team. So that's a great place to look. Um, personal, maybe a, a little personal bias. Um, I, I do wanna encourage people to really take a look at, you know, hardy shrub roses. Sometimes we hear these called landscape roses. A lot of ongoing, you know, breeding and development is going on in, in that world. Um, we, we have a wonderful rose breeder, um, Dr. David Zlezak out of the University of um, Wisconsin River Falls. The University of Minnesota has an awesome Minnesota Hardy Rose Program. For our, our friends from, from Iowa, Iowa State has Buck Roses. And, and I grew up with a soft spot for the Morden series um, and the Canadian Roses. I grew up in West Central Minnesota, so we needed like really hardy and tried and true up there. Um, so I think for me, it's maybe not so much about a specific named rose, um, although I see someone shared Campfire and I do think that one's really pretty. I have a soft spot for any rose that is kind of that yellow, orangey, pinky, sunsetty vibe, um, but that's more of a color bias. So how about you, Maddie? Well, my rose preferences are a little more biased toward the South, um, just because those are the roses that I grew up with. Um, there are some, I would just recommend in general, um, if there's roses that say that they, um, you know, were found in a certain area. So you may have heard of found roses before. So um, a lot of times those are roses that are really, they're acclimated to the environment. Um so my, you know, my favorite found roses are going to be like Caldwell Pink. Um, and that is definitely one that we get in Texas. I don't know how well it would do up here, um, but it's this big, gorgeous shrub rose. It gets five or six foot tall, even taller if it's really healthy. Um, it doesn't have a ton of disease issues and it makes these perfect little pink flowers on it. Um, but I love the found roses because if they, when you know that they're from a certain area, you know that they've apparently done well because they're, they've been around for who knows how long. And, um, so the Antique Rose Emporium in Texas, um, the owner there has done a lot of work on documenting and, you know, kind of domestic, I wouldn't say domesticating, but capturing the found roses and propagating those for people to purchase. Um, and so I love most of his roses. Um, he's who I like my Basie's purple that I was talking about on that last slide still hands up my favorite hands down hands up whatever <laughs> so my favorite rose um and it is extremely disease tolerant um but it does you know things will get to it eventually but it actually overwinters really well it goes completely dormant even in the south which is kind of crazy because most roses in the south don't go dormant they kind of stay awake um but basie's purple is like nope i'm done i'm shutting down for the year i'm dropping all my leaves um, but yeah, I, I recommend, you know, if you're really enthusiastic about roses and want some unique roses, look to see if there are found roses for your area. Um, typically, you're going to probably find those like through smaller growers, smaller producers, because they're the ones that have taken the time to kind of go out and look for these roses and document them. Um, but those are usually really great for your area because they've been there for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, and I... Someone was curious about the SDSU trial, the, the Rose Trial Gardens at SDSU, you know, what our results are. So all of our um, data from our SDSU trial, or from the trial located at SDSU, specifically at McCrory Gardens, and you're welcome to visit it. Um, you might be disappointed if you visit it because the, the roses in the trial are numbered. They're not named. So that way we as evaluators don't have a bias um, based on the name or the breeder who entered the rose in the trial. So that's another you know step for scientific rigor. Um, but if you look up um, the American Rose Trials for Sustainability um, regional winners page, you can actually click on your growing region. There's a nice map. 
and it pulls up a list of all of the winners from that region. And these are commercially available roses. And in fact, our trial team, when the results after our, our two years of research are done and regional winners are announced, um, garden centers and nurseries are the first to have that information so that they know, oh, this was a winner. Maybe we should grow or stock more of this one um, so that it's actually available for consumers. So there's a really nice list for um, Eastern South Dakota, Minnesota, swath into Iowa. The list is a little bit shorter for um, Western North Dakota and Western South Dakota because you're a little bit drier. And um, we're, we're always looking for more, more trial um, public garden partners or university partners for, for trial sites for those roses as well. But that's a great way back to what Maddie said about regionality of you know, getting those local roses. And Maddie, I know I've kept you longer, longer <laughs> and we so appreciate it. It's been a fun discussion. The last burning question was um, any recommendations for a plant ID app for identifying, you know, if we have a rose and we don't know what it is? Um, I don't have any specific recommendations. Um, I have tried a few of the apps and sometimes they're great, especially if the rose has very specific characteristics. Um, one of those roses I showed was called Bullseye and it's very like very noticeable. So the app could figure out, oh, hey, that's definitely this rose. Um, but especially when you get into roses that are just, you know, different shades of red, different shades of purple. Um, it, I've not found one that's been super accurate at identification. Um, however, there are definitely tons of rose experts out there. Um, and like Christine mentioned, tons and tons of people up here in this part of the world. Um, there's also several people that work in the rose industry in the South. So, um, you know, if you are just burning to have that rose identified, there's tons of people that you could probably reach out to that could probably help you, you know, key it out and figure out what's going on and which rose that you have. Yeah. And I will, I will say, or we could at least get you close. Yeah. <laughs> and again, so that's a, a shameless self-promotion for the SDSU Garden Hotline. We, we love hearing from you. And um, Maddie, thank you for giving us some extra time. Audience, thank you for giving us so many fun questions to respond to. This has been a really, really fun series and what a fun way to, to wrap up our time together. Um, if you would, again, kindly take a moment to fill out feedback, we'd certainly appreciate it. And I want to remind everyone that um, a great way to engage with us um, again in about uh, a week and a half would be to tune into the SDSU Extension Garden Hour. Garden Hour will begin at 7 p.m. Central Time on Tuesday, April 2nd. I will be, I will be the panel host. We'll have Laura Edwards, our state climatologist. We'll have Sidonia Trio with our garden hotline and McCrory Gardens on. And we'll be talking about getting ready for the growing season, have weather updates and um, learning, you know, learning more about um, how to, you know, address plant questions and, and solve plant mysteries in your garden. And that is also a virtual program. And we love to see people from South Dakota and our neighbors across the Midwest are certainly welcome to tune in as well. Um, another great spot to get your questions answered. And Garden Hour will begin every Tuesday, May through August. Um, same, same time, same place. And myself, Maddie Shires, John Ball, Rhoda Burroughs, Amanda Bachman, a whole cast of horticulturalists and friends of horticulture will be on that session. So again, thank you so much for tuning in today. And we look forward to seeing you in person or online at a future SDSU Extension Horticulture event. Thank you.